Man, I love me some Battle Network. Though there's not enough platforming here. If only there was a Battle Network game that lets me jump. Now we're talking. Mega Man Network Transmission. It's the only Battle Network game released on the GameCube, and is quite a departure from the other titles. If you want a recap of the events and my opinions of the first Battle Network game, you can watch it right here. The series had been traditionally made as an RPG on the Game Boy Advance, though in this game, they drastically changed the core gameplay formula and made it to a more traditional 2D platformer like the classics, while also incorporating the battle chip system from the Battle Network games. Network transmission takes place between the first and second game. The developer's goal was to combine the platforming elements from the older Mega Man titles with the role-playing and strategy elements from the Battle Network series. They probably tried to appeal to a wider audience on the GameCube, even though the install base was much smaller in there. They even even once had an idea to make a special PET themed controller for the system. Man, I wish they actually made this. I'm sad it never came to fruition. Well, did the game actually succeed? Is it a worthy entry of the Battle Network series? Eh, reception was pretty mixed, but I'll be the judge of that. I've never actually played this game, so I'll be checking this out for the first time. Let's see how good or bad this game really is. Welcome to Mega Man Network Transmission. The game begins by recapping the events of the ending of the first game after Lan and Mega Man EXE defeated World 3 and the dreaded Life Virus. And wow, what a difference from the GBA, huh? I really like the cell shaded art style, but I do admit I miss the character sprites. Not to mention some of the character models can look a bit off. I mean, seriously, stop hunching like that, Lan, it'll hurt your back. There is no English dub in this game, it's all in Japanese with English subtitles, which honestly I don't mind since I prefer their Japanese voices anyway. But, they removed the voice clips where Lan says rock, man, so now this game is terrible. Anyway, one month after these events, Lan and Mega Man are enjoying how peaceful things have been lately. Though that peace quickly fades away when news reaches out that a new type of virus known as the Zero Virus has been spreading across the net. This particular virus affects the net navvies in this world. This virus can have negative effects on their functions, and unfortunately there's no effective vaccine to stop this virus as of yet. I mean, what a scary scenario. A deadly virus that impacted the whole world? I can't imagine living in a world like that. So, what can they do to rectify this problem? Just turn it on and off again. No, seriously, that's what they do. It just works. It always works. Mail tasks you to find roles since she's lost on the net. See, nothing has changed. One game later and you still have nothing to contribute here. Unlike its predecessor, there's no hub world in this game. You'll have to rely on your map on your PET to choose what areas you want to jack into. This PET is actually based off the one introduced in Battle Network 3, even though this game technically takes place between the first and second games. Network transmission is structured like a classic Mega Man game. Though, just like the previous game, you'll still have access to your library and folder, so you can view and customize what kind of battle chips you'd like to bring with you. Though you can only carry 20 battle chips with you, so choose wisely. But you can set one battle chip as your favorite, so you can guarantee getting that specific one when you start a level. I personally like to set my double jump battle chip as my go-to, since you'll be needing it a lot. You can also buy these things called subchips from Higsby in his shop, so you can heal yourself or help fill out your custom gauge. As you jack into the net, you'll quickly see how this game operates. In Battle Network tradition, you can choose what chips you'd like to bring with you. They're limited in quantity, but you can pick up more from shops, data, or drops from random enemies. You can't just spam your chips all willy-nilly though. This time you'll have an MP gauge right next to your health bar. Both this and the custom gauge fills out over time, but man, this takes forever. I just really dislike waiting for them to fill up. I spend like about a minute waiting to change up my battle chips and it just really interrupts the flow. I mean, you can attack enemies with your buster, but look at this. This is pathetic. Enemies take forever to kill using this. I mean, eventually you can upgrade your buster capabilities by increasing their power, buster speed, and charge using power-ups. But at the beginning of the game, just use your battle chips. Your mega buster is just not worth using early on. There's a lot of exploration in the net, but you can't access or find everything on your first go. Though you can return back regularly to see if you can find any alternate paths or useful items to help you become stronger, such as HP memories, power-ups, or backup chips. Later levels, though, are far more linear and pretty much plays exactly like a classic Mega Man game. You can jump and slide to your heart's content, so if you prefer that style of Mega Man, there you go. You can also use the program advance if you use certain chips in order. For example, you can use Cannon, High Cannon, and M Cannon in that order in order to activate your Z Cannon. This pretty much works exactly as it does in the main games. The gameplay overall isn't too bad. I mean, I still prefer the gameplay mechanics from the previous game, but as a big fan of platformers, this is just okay. 
Roll proceeds to tell us about this fire up ahead and gave us some heat armor. I like her little dance right here. Pretty nice first impression so far, but my gosh the difficulty curve at the beginning of the game is insane. Like I said before, your buster is practically useless when you first start off the game. If you die, then you'll have to go back to your last save, so make sure you save often, especially when you have to deal with the first boss, Fireman. Oh yeah, he's back from the first game, just when you thought he was deleted. I do like his stage though, it remixes the Fireman stage theme from the original Mega Man. This soundtrack as a whole is amazing. We later find out that Fireman went rogue, and his operator Mr. Match had no control over him. He gave him a vaccine for the Zero Virus and he suddenly went all crazy. Lan's father, Dr. Hikari, analyzed the vaccine that Mr. Match had installed to Fireman, and found out that it was the source of the problem. Apparently, the vaccines in this world are all programs and could be used for good or nefarious purposes. The vaccine that Mr. Match gave to Fireman was a fake, so we're gonna have to go investigate who is distributing these fake vaccines. One attention to detail that I liked is that after you defeat a boss, you can view a figurine of them in your room to help celebrate your accomplishment. Speaking of boss fights, if you ever want to rebattle them and try to obtain their battle chips, you can fight them again using the battle simulator on the map here. Now that the fire on the net has been extinguished, we can explore further and try to find the true culprit. Around this point is when I started to grind for a lot of money to get a lot of healing items, armor, or other useful items in the shops. Honestly, it was pretty tedious, but I felt it was necessary due to how difficult the first boss was. So you can never be too careful. We suddenly meet this mysterious Navi called Starman EXE. We gain further insight on the Zero Virus and how it slowed down the Navi's processes, and once they're infected, you can't get rid of it in the usual way. Just turn it on and off again. Starman was the one responsible of spreading and selling the bad vaccine around, but before we could stop him, he ran away. We later found out that Dex's Navi, Gutsman, was acting crazy due to being infected by that fake Zero Virus vaccine. In order to help him come to his senses, we're gonna have to fight him. Still a pretty difficult boss fight, thank goodness I grinded. He turned back to normal after you defeated him. All Dex had to do was jack him out immediately and turn off his PET. See what I mean? It always works. After analyzing the vaccine, Dr. Ikari revealed that it has a Navi hacking effect programmed into it. We had to damage the Navis to temporarily disable them and then send them back to the PET to sleep and help them feel better. We now have a handful of options on where we want to go next. Mail needs help at the bank. Apparently the security has gone crazy and she can't get out. She can wait. Lan's mother sent an email saying how she's at the waterworks to complain about their water being out at home. The waterworks computer has gone crazy, and now we may have to miss out on dinner today. Oh man, this is serious. Higsby explains that the computer that controls the power supply at the shopping district is also out of control, and now Yai is having troubles with the system that controls her garden, causing her gardening machines to move around randomly. So many issues all at once. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go help them out. All the levels here are pretty straightforward. Biggest complaints that I had was doing Quick Man stage and fighting Bright Man. Seriously, f that boss. You could only really hit him after he attacks you. Maybe I just suck or I'm missing something, but that boss was annoying. And probably the one boss I had the most trouble on in this game. Yeah, stick that bright beam up your ass. Needleman, Iceman, and Quickman wasn't nearly as bad. Though Quickman's stage can be a pain, and Iceman's disappearing blocks was pretty annoying too. I really hate how the double jump battle chip is only found in Iceman's stage. The game doesn't really tell you about this, and you can only carry up to 10. Why do they put such a useful ability behind a battle chip? It should be a permanent upgrade. It's irritating because sometimes it feels like you're required to use them. There are certain jumps in later stages it almost feels impossible to make without them. Regardless, getting through these areas shouldn't be too difficult, especially if you take the time to grind for Zenny and buy a lot of healing items. After you finish all these four levels, Mega Man claims that he's feeling slow. That's not a good sign. We still need to look for more clues about the Zero Virus. So we received emails from Dex and some mysterious person about possible hints on where to locate information about the Zero Virus. We have to investigate a power plant and an arcade, and unfortunately, World 3 may be involved with this. Cha tries to take control of the situation and asks for Lan not to get involved since he considers him a nuisance. Yeah, thanks dude. It's not like I saved you all from the life virus last game or anything. Anyway, we found out that the arcade was invaded by Color Man, an ex-World 3 Navi. He decided that he wanted revenge for last time. His operator, Miss Mad, has been ignoring him lately. So apparently, he got bored and decided to mess with the arcade, just for funsies. That's it. That's why he's here. He has nothing to do with the Zero Virus whatsoever. So all of this was just a waste of time. 
great. We decided to explore the power plant next, so we received this information from this supposed fan of LAN. The level itself was fine, except for this electricity and ladder section being annoying. This was before I found out about the double jump, so I kind of struggled to get past this. Elecman is here apparently, another X-World 3 Navi, though he was also hacked and got infected by the virus. But he came to his senses after he was defeated, and had no recollection in these events, and just leaves. Dr. Ikari says that someone was indiscriminately sending emails to Scilab. The message provided information about the Zero virus, but when they go to the specified location, a powerful hacked Navi will attack you. He told Lan to ignore these emails. Too late for that. And then suddenly, Mega Man started to feel even more sluggish lately, and we find out that he was actually infected with the Zero Virus as well. We gave him some emergency first aid to temporarily relieve him. Unfortunately, it's hard to cure him without knowing more about the Zero Virus. There may be more clues in this area called the Zero Account. Dr. Ikari found some old World 3 files and found out that the Zero Virus was created by Wily himself. As we get closer to the Zero account, be sure to grab this Sauce file. Oh my mistake, I meant Source file in the Global Area 3. It's important for later, but it's not mandatory. We can't decipher this yet, so we'll have to give it to Dr. Hikari to figure out what this data means. Give me the Sauce. We then had to overcome these barriers blocking the entrance to Zero account. First we have the old area, which honestly felt impossible to make these jumps until I got the double jump. We find that Proto Man got damaged and may have gotten infected with the Zero virus as well. We need to fight Swordman EXE. He was guarding the passcodes needed to open the way to Zero Account. As we go deeper, we go into this strange gravity area to fight Gravity Man, and then venture our way to go to the no gravity area. Dr. Ikari finally finished analyzing the Zero Virus, and sent a vaccine to Mega Man to help him feel back to normal. Unfortunately, this still only temporarily cures it, due to the Zero Virus evolving over time. Even with this vaccine, new versions of the Zero Virus will still spread from the Zero Account throughout all the Cyber Worlds. So, we're still not done yet. We finally meet with Starman once again, and he confirms that he was the one who was spreading the Zero Virus and hacking program. Why did Lan act so surprised? I thought he told us already. Though the guy operating him is the true criminal. Starman is a pretty easy boss fight though. Poor loser. Finally, the path to Zero Count opens. Once we finish traversing here, we encounter the source of the virus, Zero EXE. He's a cursed and powerful virus that's able to see and hear everything throughout the cyber world. He uses the Zero Virus' ability to transmit information. At first, he did this to spy and gather information, but over time, he gained a soul, which is pretty abnormal for a virus. He talks about how we are warriors fighting for peace, and he just spreads evil by simply existing. Kind of like Twitter users. He can be a tricky boss fight, but with enough endurance and healing items, he's not too bad. As his name implies, he's modeled after Zero from the X-Series. He even shares a similar moveset as him. When he's defeated, he explains that our power through friendship was extraordinary. He never felt it before, but he thinks that he understands it after our battle. He mentions that he didn't want to be born as a virus, but he wanted to know one thing. He wanted to learn more about the world he was born in, and its people. Lan and Mega Man seems to understand Zero a bit more after this exchange. It makes him feel more sympathetic in a way. Maybe he's not such a bad guy after all. Shot and Proto Man proceeds to butt their way in to try to finish him off claiming that he's a menace and a threat to everyone. Fortunately, Dr. Ikari interrupts saying that there's no need to delete Zero after all, thanks to that mysterious source file we found earlier. This actually belonged to Zero himself, and it was left by Dr. Wily. After Dr. Ikari fully analyzed it, he can finally seal in the Zero virus function. This means that Zero can finally become a normal Navi again. If you actually didn't pick up that file from Global Area 3, then you'll trigger the bad ending where Zero actually gets deleted by Proto Man. Kind of dark if you ask me. Just when you think things are looking up, the true mastermind reveals himself. He calls himself the Professor from World 3. He took over after Wily to revive the life virus. He called forth Zero after Wily froze him and made Starman distribute a bunch of fake vaccines to hack all of the net navvies. He used the money that he made from selling those fake vaccines to help revive the life virus. He aims to hack into the military's computers around the world to deploy missiles to try to destroy humanity under Wily's principles. After some sentimental reassurance from Mega Man and Dex of all people, Lan receives the encouragement that he needs to destroy the life virus once and for all. I really love that they use the Japanese opening theme from the first season of Rockman EXE here. I mentioned this already, but this soundtrack is just simply amazing. We now have to explore the Undernet in order to locate the life virus. However, we can't pinpoint the location due to the professor using an auto jump trap to send us to a different place from where we want to go. We need to locate the authorization code in order to find the life virus. So we have to explore X World 3 facilities like the secret metro line from the first game to give us hints. We have to fight the super bosses from the first game, Shadow Man and Feral Man, in order to help repair the authorization code. If you look carefully in Feral Man's stage, you can find a secret area where you can find Rush. And now he's dead. 
Rest in peace, doggo. Before we get ready for the final battle, we can have this optional boss fight with Chod and Proto Man. It's not required, but I just can't help but prove my superiority over him. Eat that, pretty boy. Now we can venture towards the Undernet, and the enemies here are just so annoying. They all have barriers, so be sure you have enough strong battle chips to break them. Or be like me and just take the hit and screw it. We then have to penetrate their defenses, complete a traditional Mega Man boss rush, and obtain help from all of our friends to help prepare us fight the life virus. So what are the professor's motives anyway? He wants to reset the internet-centric world that Lan's grandfather created, and reconstruct the robot civilization that Dr. Wily dreamed of. Apparently he shares the same dream as Wily. He doesn't explain why or how that justifies all the missiles he's fired. He just tells them to shut up in retaliation. What a lame villain. Now we fight the life virus R. He's upgraded with Zero's data. Not too hard of a boss fight, we just need to break his barrier revealing his weak point just like the first game. Not much of an upgrade honestly. Though he transforms into this creepy thing in his second form, but this phase is even easier than the first one. The difficulty in this game is all over the place. Now that we defeated him, what happens now? Looks like the police found and arrested him. Kind of anticlimactic if you ask me. Though the reason why he was so easy to track down was because of Zero. He became reborn as a Navi. Apparently the professor's computer was infected with the Zero virus all this time, which means that Zero can easily pinpoint his location. In the alternate ending where Zero's deleted, the moment, or monent as this typo implies, they defeated the life virus, it caused a bug in the program causing the professor to reveal his location. I definitely prefer the good ending. Not to mention, you also miss out on Zero's battle chip if you don't end up picking up the data from earlier. Now that this is all over, Zero decides to explore the cyber world for the rest of his days, and peace has been restored once again. Now to sell all these figures on eBay. After the credits roll, we see that Shadow Man is speaking to this mysterious figure named Mr. Dark. He talks about this new sponsor who is a net crime organization that has been growing lately called Gospel. What does this all mean? guess we'll have to find out in Battle Network 2. What about post-game though? What else can we do? The only real option here is to collect all the game's battle chips and have this optional boss fight with base. But honestly, I'm not too motivated to do that. I feel like I've had my fill with this game. Man, what a roller coaster. On one hand, I enjoyed a good majority of the levels. The music is fantastic and the gameplay's alright, but some of this game's design choices can be a bit odd. I really don't like waiting a lot to fill up my custom gauge or MP meter. I mean, yeah, you can use subchips to help mitigate the long waiting times, but still. It just feels slower paced compared to other Mega Man titles. I appreciate the change in style in this subseries, but I still think the original formula of the first game and the other mainline games are far more charming. And this is coming from the guy who really loves their platformers. As a 2D platformer, it's pretty bare bones. Not terrible, but I'd still rather play the Classic or the X series over this. I enjoyed my time playing through this, but the amount of grinding I had to do, frustrating level segments, and annoying boss fights that I had to endure, especially towards the beginning, really dragged down the experience. The difficulty here is all over the place. It can get really challenging, at least up until you upgrade or grind for healing items then it becomes a cakewalk. Maybe that's my own fault for grinding for materials, but due to the struggle that I was having completing these boss fights or levels, I felt like it was required, which really isn't a good thing to do in a platformer of all things. I didn't really have to do that in other classic Mega Man games. It just breaks down the pace when all I want to do is breeze through these levels one by one. The story was alright, but nothing too special. It just doesn't hit the same highs as the stories in the other Battle Network games. Also, the fact that the main villain and his motives here being too monotonous really doesn't do this game any favors. That's not to say this game is bad though. Far from it. The game has its merits. I found it fun despite its shortcomings. I still think it's worth playing if you're a fan of the Battle Network series. Just be wary of the flaws it has. Playing this game helped me realize that jumping is so overrated. So now I decided that from this day forth, I'll never jump in any video game ever again.